Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. How are you doing today? So glad to have you here with us, and I hope that you will find yourself just a little bit better today. By the end of listening to this broadcast, that you will have that thing that you need to make the needle point shift. Um, you know, it's been several months since I've done a standalone show, and I want to just share some things that are on my heart with you today. Um, the best-selling author, if you will, that I'm going to bring to you today is me. Um, you know, I've had several bestsellers. Um, I'm actually in the process of taking my uh, longer book, and I'm breaking it down into 10 pieces. And um, last, uh, actually on break Black Friday, on our Black Friday extravaganza, it was one of the books that... Um, you know, was promoted then. Um, I've used it as part of our nine-week bestseller formula class as the example book for how to be able to, you know, select categories and different things like that. Um, you know, so it's it's both something fun for me as well as a labor of love project, as well as something that's been able to step in and really help uh, a lot of situations for people um, in the training that we do and stuff like that. The book is, uh, you know, the main book is called 10 Things You Must Have to Succeed in Life and Business. And I have now broken it down into 10 books, um, you know, because if you've listened to Kathy and I at all, we've discovered the power and the secret behind short reads. Um, and really, a 10-book series is so much more impactful for you than, uh, you know, a book that has 10 different things in it. Think about it for a second. You know, if you went into Google and you said, I'd like to know about passion and about how to um, get a good coach and about how to um, f manage my money um, and how to reward myself for succeeding, um, you know, Google would be like, you know, I can't really provide you a return response that's relevant on so many different topics. Um, conversely, if you did actually just ask one of those questions, um, Google doesn't have the ability to say, you know what you're looking for. Buried within this book, chapter five of it has exactly what you're looking for. Um, however, if chapter five is its whole own standalone book, um, think about how good that is. Um, you know, and there's just so many angles that you can use that for being a best selling author, having your book be um, bite sizable. Um, I always tell people it's like forget about a word count, a page count, but just simply concentrate, focus on content. Take a point, make it really clear, and then give them an action that they can take from that. Um, and that's what we try to do here on the show, too. You know, we try to take a point, make it as clear as possible for you over the course of an hour, um, and then, you know, make it really, really easy for you to then take a step. Just a little step. Just a needle point shift. Just, you know, just as, as even as little as a grain of mustard seed. Um, you know, the mustard seed is the smallest of all um, you know, seeds, and yet it grows into one of the largest plants that comes from a small seed. Um, and so those are the kind of things that you really just want to um, to be able to focus on, is not trying to change the whole entire world, um, but simply, uh, you know, trying to just make a little shift, just update things just a little bit today, just move down the road just a little further today. Is that fair? Is that something we can focus on? Is just what little tiny bit of information can we help you with today? So today I want to talk about, like I said, um, you know, from book one of my 10 book series um, called um, Thriving Success. 
which is what you know the ten you know the large book became, um, is the Thriving Success series, and book one is called Passion, and I want to talk to you today about your passion. Um, often we uh, you know I, I, it was so much fun for me a couple of years ago. I actually was a, a coach for the E Women Network. I was one of their uh, one of their coaches, and I was at the Na- international convention. Um, and I spent most of the weekend down in my little booth coaching people. Um, they were laser coaching sessions, about 15 minutes per person, um, you know, really trying to laser in on what they were doing. And, and we had some ideas that we were bringing to people. But what I found was the number one question, even with the other coaches that were there and some of them were helping, the number one question that people really were struggling with was, the focus, and it had to do with that passion. It had to do with not really having narrowed down what it is that they are good at, what they want to do, what they want to spend their time on. Again, like I said, what is my passion? You know, I've even had people just flat out say to me, I don't know that I know what my passion is. Um, I was helping an author uh, with a book that's upcoming here in about a month or so. And she actually said that she uh, was talking to a person and the person actually said to her that they don't think you can have your passion and work a job that makes you money. And, And I totally disagree with that. And I hope that throughout the course of today, we can help you really get um, a passion for, if you will, your passion. So get some just a little inside secrets in what is it that I'm passionate about and how do I discover that and then how do I make that into something that I can actually make money from? That's uh, always an important one, isn't it? You know, is, is that you can make money from it. Um, you know, there's the old saying that if you do what you love, you'll never work a day of your life. And that that is true. Um, there's a way that I put it in my book that maybe brings it in a little bit more succinctly and it's that your passion is that thing that drives you. Um, Every business, I don't care how great or how small it is, whether you're talking about Amazon, you know, because Jeff Bezos is now the richest man in the world or, you you know, you want to go back a little bit to uh, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or, or different ones like that that have been the richest person in the world and have had their company be the highest uh, traded, um, you know, the highest dollar value per stock of, of a company. Um, you know, even with them, there have been tough times in their business. Jeff Bezos talks about how when he first started Amazon, Um, He was working out of his garage and um, he thought it was exciting when he finally got enough money that he could buy knee pads so that while he was packaging books into boxes on his knees in the garage that he finally had some padding for his knees. And, you know, of course, we all know how huge Amazon is now, but, you know, there were those days, you know, those times when you work so hard and your back hurts and you've got a headache and and things aren't necessarily just like peachy keen super cool you know you're like i don't know it is at those moments that it's our passion that drives us through if you're working on something that's just a fad just a trend you know you you jumped in on the latest thing that people were saying you should do it's really hard to sustain fire all under that over the long term because at some point reality is going to kick in and you're going to find yourself going oh man this is work this is not fun i've got a customer complaint i've got people trying to do chargebacks i've got you know this issue or that issue or you know maybe if it's even fun you know you're traveling around the world but at some point you get to the place where you're like man i would just love to just sleep in my own bed um and at the end of the day It's the passion for your business that drives you. And by really understanding what it is that you're passionate about and why it is that doing the business that you have really helps you, propels you towards that, that's how you can live as a thriving entrepreneur. We're going to talk about this episode. Don't go away. We'll be right back. 
You've heard Kathy and I talk about it. You've seen the workshops. You have watched as others of your friends have become a best-selling author. And now it's your turn. Let me ask you this. What would being a best-selling author do for your business? Over 80% of people surveyed said that they want to write a book, which means that if you're listening, you probably are one of those people. Now is your time because you have a message that needs to be shared. That message is not for you. It's not for your ego. It is because it serves other people. Kathy and I are here to help you share your unique brilliance with the world. All you need to do is go to wehelpyouthrive.com, check us out, and find out how you can be a best-selling author today. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back. You're listening to Thriving Entrepreneur. We're talking today about my book, actually, um, from the Thriving Success series, book one, Passion. We want to talk to you about what you're passionate about. Now, a lot of times, um, you know, because all of us live in an age of social media, live in a time where, um, you know, passion seems like, uh, something that is just really going to talk about now about a Harlequin movie, <laughs> you know, a Harlequin romance novel or something like that. And um, you think that we should have Fabio be the guest star on this episode if we're going to talk about passion or, you know, somebody from a soap opera or something. But that's not really the kind of passion I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about that inner thing inside of you, that core of who you are that comes out in everything you do, Um, you know, and so let's start, let's dive into it. Today I want it to be as practical as I can. Grab yourself a piece of paper and a pen, take some notes. Um, You know, some of these questions you'll be able to jot down immediately and some of them you're going to have to, you know, come back and think about, Um, you know. So let's start off very first and that's what am I passionate about? Um, What does that even mean? Um, There are the things that are so part of who you are, they come out in everything you do. Uh, For those of us that are parents, um, usually the best way to be able to start seeing the, uh, if you will, secrets of what we're passionate about is watch the faces of our children, especially their teens. Um, That's a whole different story. That's a whole different episode. But, um, you know, at that age, by that point, Um, this cue really works well. Watch their face. And when you start talking about something and they roll their eyes and give you that, oh, mom, look, (laughs) you know, there goes dad again, you know, that kind of thing. Um, That's a secret. It's a secret to the core of our passion because the core of who we are, who we really are, what we really believe, what's really deep down inside of us, It comes out in everything we do. Um, You know, I I often use the example when I'm talking to people when they're just totally lost and they're like, I don't even know, you know. I, I start talking to them about some of the basic things that they say all the time. Um, again, a lot of times as parents, uh, there are things that are clues that we have no idea are leading us so impactfully. Um, And so the one I always use as an example is, do you find yourself constantly saying, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room? Or maybe, uh, you know, maybe your thing is, turn the light off, turn the lights off, don't forget to turn the light off. Did you turn the light off? (laughs) That kind of thing. You know, those of you that are parents, you're laughing because you've done that a million times. Um, You know, and you're like, well, yeah, I've seen my kids roll my eyes about, roll their eyes about that one all the time. Um, Buried within inside of that, though, is the germ of your passion. There's a reason behind it. Um, now I know that our children think that the only reason behind it and for it is because we just want to nag and annoy them. Um, and as fun as that might be, (laughs) um, you know, that really is not what we're intending. 
there is a reason behind it. So if you go back to the clean up your room, there can be many different reasons for you. And I'll just give you a few examples. You know, it may be that cleanliness is a skill that you want them to learn. Um, you know, my mom definitely, that was one of the things in her mind a lot was, you know, she wanted us to learn the skill of cleaning. Um, for other people, they're very organized. Their personality, who they are as people, they're a very organized person and they want to pass that organizational skill on to their children. Regardless of the personality of their child, they they see the benefit of that organization and they want to help them learn to be organized. Um, for other people, it could be something just as simple as the dynamic of the fact that in life there are just certain things that we have to do. It isn't because they're fun. It isn't because they're entertaining. It's just those are the things we have to do, you know. Um, you know, if we want to have money, we have to work. Um, you know, those kind of things. Um, and so often for that person, uh, you know, they still find themselves saying, clean your room. But it's it's much more based in that as a person existing in the world, um, you know, that's one of the elements. You can't just go through life. Um, I always think of the old Charlie Brown commercial uh, cartoon, you know, with Pigpen, who, you know, was just such a mess that he had, you know, a cloud of yuck all around him, you know, and, and uh, you know, it was intended to try to, I hope, help children you know, think about their cleanliness and that kind of thing. And, of course, it was also based from a parental concept of, you know, I just this kid is just a whirlwind of yuck and dirt. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, that can be something that's really important for us to pass on to our children. Now, for other people, it just doesn't matter. I love that I have this story to be able to share with you. Um, <laughs> my first wife... Um, in my first marriage early on, we, uh, her mother was not a clean person. Um, she was not the clean up your room, clean up your room, clean up your room kind of person. Um, the perfect example is we went to her house on Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving dinner. You know, the whole family, their whole family, everybody was there. Thanksgiving dinner, turkey, you know, the whole, you think about the traditional American Thanksgiving dinner, you know, you know what, what the day was like. Um, and, uh, you know, and one of the parts of that is you cook the whole turkey um, and you pull the pan out of the oven and, you know, and then you, in one way or another, you take the meat off the bone. Um, now, for everybody that's listening that's a vegan or vegetarian, I just disgusted you. I'm sorry, but that is the nature of, of a turkey dinner. Um, <laughs> so there is the remainder of the meat and especially the carcass of the turkey that when you're talking about a whole turkey, when you're talking about not having bought a turkey breast or something like that, but you're talking about a whole turkey that, that um, you know, that's leftover and it's not really that usable. Uh, now, if you talk to my mom or my grandmother, they could talk to you about ways you can boil it and get all the meat and all the juices out of it and make a gravy and all kinds of stuff. But, but basically, there's going to be some part of it that needs to get thrown away is the point. Um, so Thanksgiving's over. Uh, we go back to our house. Um, and uh, I don't know with the nature of the way that our life was at that point. I know I was working, um, you know, a late night job and we had very small children, babies. Um, so, you know, going over to in-law's house wasn't a daily occurrence kind of thing, even though we lived, uh, you know, across town from them, basically. But uh, we went back on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, one of the two. Um, that turkey carcass was sitting on the counter, you know, the kitchen island in the kitchen. We had to literally clean the kitchen from Thanksgiving on Christmas Day before we could then start into the cooking of Christmas dinner. Um, as I said, not a person who cleanliness was, was something that bothered her a whole lot. 
Um, and I always tell that story because a lot of times when we use the phrase clean up your room, clean up your room, you know, go pick up that stuff, go do the dishes, those kind of things, we um, get uh, lulled into believing that it's wrong for us to do that or that that's so normal that, um, you know, that it shouldn't be something that's the core of our passion. But what I can tell you is, is that there are people who it's not part of their life. It's not part of their existence. That's not a judgment of them. That's just simply who they are and how they show up in the world. And that's going to not gel with who you are. Now, if you're like, I can totally see that. I've I've had a holiday where, you know, that Thanksgiving dinner dishes were still sitting in the sink from, you know, at Christmas time. Then you totally relate to my former mother-in-law, you know, um... And a lot of you are like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe that. That's probably not true, you know, because it's just so far from your your frame of reference. And um, either way, there's a germ in there that really begins to start leading you to understanding your passion because it's the why behind that. Now, the why could be as simple as starting out with, you know, I grew up in a very dirty house and I committed to myself that I would never live that way. The opposite of that is true, too. I know a lot of us whose mothers were extremely meticulous, great at housekeeping, grew up with a desire to have our houses be more casual when it came to the day-to-day cleaning than what our mothers were. And that's not a diss at my mom. My mom was a great housekeeper, um, and she did an amazing thing, uh, amazing stuff around the house on so many different levels. But um, you know, it instilled in me that ethic, that work ethic, but it did not instill into me that as a core value for me. For me, I, I'm i okay if the bed doesn't get made every morning. I'm all right if there's only one dish that got used, if it sits in the sink and rinses or soaks um, or waits, you know, until you can fill the dishwasher, until, you know, there's enough dishes to wash them by hand either way. That's just who I am. Um, You know, that drives my mom insane (laughs) to this day. You know, she comes to my house and there is a sink in the dishes. Uh, She, you know, in the the sink. Um, If there's a dish in the sink, did that make any sense? I don't know. Um, You know, she will, uh, you know, she'll immediately start doing dishes. (laughs) She's just that person. Um, And I love her for it. And and that's okay because that's part of the core of who she is. Um, And... We find inside of that, when we peel back the onion, the deeper meaning behind that, the why. Why is it okay to leave a dish in the sink? What's our rationale behind that? Why do we tell our children to pick up their room? Because like you said, I gave you the whole list of all the different reasons. And for you, it may even be a different one than that. You're like, well, I tell them that because, you know, whatever. Um... And we move beyond the messages of our mother in that particular situation. Typically, it's your mom. No offense to the dads that are stay-at-home dads, those kind of things. But um, we move beyond that message to the core of our belief and why do we believe what we believe. When we move beyond rebellion, you know, the my mom made me clean my room, so I'm not going to clean my room at all, to the... This is how I want to live in the world. Behind that is a why. And that's what I want you to concentrate on. That's what I want you to think about. What is the why behind that thing that you're accused of being naggy about? I'll give you another great example. Many of you know my my dear wife, Kathy. Um, She's amazing. Uh, She is an incredible business person. Um, Her whole life, she's been a business person. Um, you know, going back to as a small child, uh, selling, you know, her used dolls and stuff to raise money for whatever money thing she needed. Um, and her, for her as a young adult, the fun thing for her was to sit in Sherry's, um, or a Denny's and, uh, you know, get a pot of coffee and write out business plans and business concepts. Um, and uh, that 
is because at the core of her, she is an amazing researcher. I promise you, if you do a coaching session with Kathy, she will up-level your business. Whether she knows anything about it or not, she will up-level your business. Not because she's know-all, know-it-all, but because she will go to the internet she will use that talent that she has for research and she will find out what's working, what's not working. What do your competitors do? What are they missing that they should do? What is the market asking for? You know, there's often um, things that are searched for on Google that um, get limited uh, what, what Google would call high relevant. Uh, results because there isn't something that is specific to that. It gives more generic response than the really specific one that Google would prefer to give. And she can find out all those things and come back to you and say, hey, look, you know, here is where the market is. This is the direction it's going. This is the place where your biggest competitor has stumbled um, and that kind of thing. Um, and that is the heart and the core of who she is as a person, how she shows up in the world, to other people, including our own children. And this, again, is not a diss at our children. Um, you know, they were kids at the time, so they didn't really understand it. The ability to see businesses um, and to have business ideas, she's been accused of having one scam or another, is the word that people use. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is for the last, um, you know, all of her adult life, Kathy has been a marketing expert. And it's always been about marketing, 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 marketing research, that kind of a thing. That is the core of everything she's done. That is the passion behind who she is and what she does. And it always shows up. And regardless of what it shows up as, it's the passion behind it, the truth of who she is that always shows up in the world. And the people that have said, well, you know, that's just another one of her scams, don't really understand the heart and the core of who she is and what purpose she's put on this earth to serve. And so often the things that people accuse us of that we are unfocused, that we are scamming, that we are always talking about that, that kind of thing. That becomes step one in beginning to discover what is the thing that truly is my passion. So make some notes during this commercial break and we'll be back and we'll talk more about how to have your passion show up in your life and live as a thriving entrepreneur. You've heard Kathy and I talk about it. You've seen the workshops. You have watched as others of your friends have become a best-selling author. And now it's your turn. Let me ask you this. What would being a best-selling author do for your business? Over 80% of people surveyed said that they want to write a book, which means that if you're listening, you probably are one of those people. Now is your time because you have a message that needs to be shared. That message is not for you. It's not for your ego. It is because it serves other people. Kathy and I are here to help you share your unique brilliance with the world. All you need to do is go to We Help youthrive.com check us out and find out how you can be a best selling author today welcome back to thriving entrepreneur this is Steve welcome back thanks for listening to thriving entrepreneur did you make some notes over the last break um, some things that are your passion some things that you've been accused of of going off on a tangent about things that your children roll their eyes at you because you're always talking about it. Oh, there goes mom again. She's off on that tangent, you know. And um, I hope you did because I, I know that we're not here on purpose to annoy our children. 
that that may be a fun side benefit. <laughs> but um, no, seriously, I know that who you are is coming out. It's, it's inside of you. At your lowest moment, that piece of the real who you are jumps out from within you. Because it just, it is, it, it, it can't be held back. It is what makes up who you are. So think about, for a minute, a time when you've been really sad, um, you know, or you've had a really strong emotion, possibly even really happy, um, and something's come up that triggers you because... It's a part of that thing that you talk about all the time. You know, um, have you ever been listening to the radio and the DJ, or if you listen to talk radio ever, you know, the, the radio guy will say something and you just find yourself just going off, you know. Um, Kathy and I like to go on, on drives uh, you know, we call them coffee drive in the morning. We started it actually when the kids were little. You know, there were five children in the house. Maya was three. Uh, Amber would have been like 13 at the time, if my memory serves correctly. Um, you know, and so you're talking about five kids between three and 13. And uh, Kathy was a stay-at-home mom. And, uh, you know, there were... It was tough. <laughs> Any of you that have raised children know how that is. And sometimes the best thing you can do in the world is just to have a chance to get away. And that's where Coffee Drive started. It was a way that I could step in, give Kathy permission to be away from the children for a short period of time um, and do something totally just for her. We would go to Starbucks which was at that point in our life a real, uh, a real splurge. You know, um, we feel blessed that you know that our business is doing so much better, and that you know now the going to Starbucks is just kind of part of the ritual as opposed to a specific thing that we splurge on to let her know how special she is. Um, you know, we would get the coffee and then we would drive around for a little while and give her a chance to be able to decompress, to express the things she was feeling, to have adult conversations. Those of you that are stay at home parents, I was a single parent of five kids for, um, because there's actually an older one besides the five that were there. Um, you know, when Kathy and I got married, the older one had already gone. Um, you know, so I get it. I totally get it. You know, I, um, sometimes you just, you would do anything to just have a conversation with an adult. And, uh, and so we would do that. But sometimes while you're driving around, somebody would do something or there would be a sign, um, you know, off to the side of the road or something and that would trigger. And, and one of us would, would, uh, find ourselves, um, very passionately expressing, our viewpoints on that thing. And this was early on in our marriage. You know, this is when we were first married. So it was also, uh, you know, a good way to get to know each other and find out what kind of things are important to one another, um, you know, through that process. And, um, uh, you know, I really encourage that for uh, couples to have a time when they're away that's specifically designed for them to both be together as well as to talk. Um, you know, and that's a really great way to, to help your, your marriage. That's just a little rabbit trail that maybe was better than the whole sermon today. Um, you know, and it's in those moments that your passion comes up, even though, um, you know, whether you're talking about when Kathy was, you know, stay at home mom, five kids, or back previously to that, when I was a single dad, working a second shift, you know, basically all evenings kind of a job to uh, be there for the kids to get them off to the school and home from school and fed and those kind of things. Um, you know, it becomes all encompassing in your day. And uh, 
even in those times when the core of who you are is not necessarily, it at least doesn't feel like it's the primary thing that you get to spend your day on. It still is in there. It still comes out. Comes out in the books you choose to read, in the uh, communications you start to have. You know, and now, of course, with social media having blown up, um, you know, to the point that it is, you know, you can you can join groups on Facebook. You can follow people um, in Instagram and things like that that are on that same wavelength, and they give you that way to be able to still experience that thing. Maybe you have a very artistic side, and and uh, maybe you don't get to do a whole lot of painting right now yourself, but you can go on to Snapchat and you can see, uh, you know, artistic things that people have done. Or, you know, any kind of thing. I, I, you know, whatever your passion might have to be. Uh, you know, not have to be, but, but is. Um, so, secondly, so the first thing we talked about was, you know, the clues that start showing themselves up. What are the things that, you know, we just talk about all the time. They just pop out of us. Um, secondly is, um, what are people constantly coming to you for? And this is a big one. Um, I talked even last, last episode a little bit about this. Um, you know, we have a gifting. And our gifting is tends to be to the world kind of like a lighthouse is to a ship out on the ocean. You know, it's very happenstantial for us. We're inside of the building, so we don't see the light. But way out on the water, it's guiding the people home safely. And our core of who we are shines like a beacon to the people that it's meant to serve. Um, so that's going to show up. Um, and often the people that continue to be drawn to you are your second real clear indication of your passion and the direction that you should be going, that you, um, that the core of who you are is. Because when your light goes out, who's seeing that beacon? You know, again, let's go back to a lighthouse. The lighthouse is designed to help ships, you know, both avoid dangerous area as well as find a way to come home. Well, um, you know, they're not really designed to help people who are in the middle of the, you know... 50 miles away from the coastline find their way from inland to shore. They don't shine that way. You know, just like the beacon that goes up in the air from an airport to help an airplane find the runway. You know, they shine up in the air so that the planes can see them. They're not shooting out across the ocean so that so that ships can find their way to the airport, they're not needed for that. You know, there are a lot of airports that I've flown in and out of that are right on often. You know, sometimes the, the runway even jets out into the ocean. Um, you know, but the lighting is done for the, for the airplanes up in the air, not for the boats down, you know, to pull them in. That's not what it's for. And that's the same thing with your passion. It shines a beacon to the ones who are meant to come to that place of safety that you give to them. So, like I was talking about last week, you know, Amber. Many of you know Amber. Um, Amber has a real um, magnet for helping people, um, elderly people. Um, and she always has. You know, and I told the story last week about how all six of us, or seven of us, would be um, in a store. And, uh, you know, 
a, a little old lady would walk up to Amber um, in the midst of all of us and say, Honey, could you help me? I can't get this shot. It's not something Amber was actively pursuing. In fact, um, you know, as is the case with a lot of us, it's not necessarily something that um, is something that she really wanted to pursue. But the core of who we are and that gifting that we have inside of us, it shows up. It shows up in so many ways. Now in our business, it shows up as Amber being able to be very helpful to um, the people that are in our company. And although a lot of our clients are not what I would call quote-unquote little old ladies, and I apologize to any of you that are uh, over whatever age, and if the phrase little old lady is offensive, I'm not meaning it that way at all. Um, you know, it is still, though, a very good indication of her heart, which is that she sends out a beacon to people saying, I can, I can help. Despite this whole crowd of people that are here, if you come up to me, I can help you with that little simple task. We can get it done together. And that's how she shows up in the world. And that's cool. I really think it's awesome. That is your second clue. Who are the people that keep coming into your life? You know, often we we don't want that. I mean, really, this part of discovering our passion is the hard part because um, most of us fight the core of what we're supposed to be doing in the world. Um, you know, I hope that you find some really, uh, you know, useful things out of this radio show that I do every week. I fought it for a decade. If I would have just listened to Kathy, who I've told you is an amazing researcher and, and will uplevel your business, if I had just listened to her, I'd have, I'd, I'd had a podcast 10 years earlier than what I had it. But I was resistant to it. Lots of reasons, lots of excuses, but I was. And often we find ourselves, because the people that are coming to us with the need that they have isn't that thing that we've told ourselves we want to do with our life. We fight against it. We ignore it. We sometimes don't even see it. So I encourage you, stop for a second. What is the thing that you do with grace and ease that you're resistant to doing? Because one of two things, A, either it's so easy for you that you've convinced yourself that anybody can do it, or B, you have a personal definition of who you are and how you're going to show up in the world. And that doesn't gel with what you want that definition to be. You want to be over here on the right hand, and that's over here on the left hand. Think about that one for a minute. I know it's tough. Um, we all do it. Um, we all fight against it. Um, but it's true that the number, the, the, probably one of the biggest indicators of who we are, what we're meant to do in this world, is who continues to be drawn to us. I'll give you a perfect example in my life. So uh, many of you know, uh, you know, if for no other reason than the fact that you heard the intro to the show, um, I'm a third generation minister. I grew up in the church. You know, I have the the church pedigree that, uh, you know, people would die for. You know, my grandfather was a minister from the time he was 25 until he passed. I mean, I guess technically he retired for like a year or two. But, you know, it was like 60 plus years that he ministered in churches. Small, tiny churches. He was, you know, most of them even though it was, you know, mid-1900s to the 1980s, you know, that time frame, um, you know, most of the churches that you were in 
would be considered like pioneer kind of setting. Um, you know, and then my father, um, you know, and, and that's my grandfather. That's actually my mom's dad. My mom went off, met and married a, a gentleman who, you know, that's what he knew his calling was, was to be a pastor. And my dad is still a pastor. My dad's in his late 70s now. Um, and he's been ministering in churches since, well, you know, I mean, to some extent even before, but since he was, you know, in his late teens to 20 years old. And he's been a minister most all of that time. Um, you know, and so I was raised in church, you know. Uh, I remember the, the lyric from a song by, um, I think it's Brian Duncan, you know, who's like, you know, I was born on Thursday and in church on Sunday and I was never late because my dad was the preacher and my mom played the piano and I took up the offering. They kept making me give it back, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, and, and although, uh, you know, it was just that kind of a situation. I was there in the church my whole life and yet as an adult, as I began to show up in the world, I began to see that the people who found themselves attracted to me, the the beacon that I was putting out into the world and the people that were being drawn back into me were not people who fit that demographic. In fact, here's a really funny one for you. A lot of times people in church don't like me. <laughs> now, I know now as an adult, it used to be really tough. I mean, it used to be very difficult because, I, you know, it's like, this is where I'm supposed to belong. This is supposed to be home. And, and it wasn't. But I know now my gifting is that of an evangelist. Um, you know, and, and very simply put, I'm the guy standing outside the door telling people, hey, there's a door here. Come on through. You'll like what's on the other side of it. You know, I mean, that's the simple definition of what an evangelist is. And so, by definition, that means that I'm not on the inside. I'm on the outside. Because that's where the people that I'm supposed to meet are at. And that's okay. And that's cool, in fact. But I spent years fighting it. Years trying to be something different, either too much of a rebel to change the structure of the church or um, too conformed to try to change the structure of who I am to be some uh, version of something I believed in my mind I was supposed to be. But those weren't the people that were brought to me. Early on, when I was 18 through about 25, I was the lead singer in a Christian rock band. Um, you know, we're talking the late 80s, and there were a lot of uh, emerging Christian rock bands at the time. We were a little bit different in that by the late 80s, uh, rock music to some extent had been accepted in the church. Our following were all people who never would go to church. We sang at keggers and at bars and things like that. And for those of you that know me, you'll find that to be ironic because I don't drink. It's not, you know, some kind of religious thing. I just, I just don't appreciate it. I'm just not into alcohol. And so, you know, I would be there in those situations singing extremely Christian songs. We didn't compromise what we were saying. And we had a following of people that actually were, you know, they would ask us to sing certain ones of our songs, um, you know, because they had seen us several different places. And that's just how I show up in the world. And so I want you to think about that because you can fight against it. You don't have to go that direction. But at the core of who you are, there is a core of who you are. It's really, I guess, how to say it. And it's going to show up. And it, that beacon is going to draw that same group of people to you over and over again. Now the question becomes is, do we understand and appreciate our passion and then go for it? Really, really dive into meeting the needs of those people that are coming to us 
Or do we fight it because we've decided that we want to be something else, that that's not who we are, that's not how we want to show up in the world, and so we fight against it. The choice is yours. I'm not here to force you to do anything, but just simply to give you some information. But I can tell you that the second secret is, if you want to see what your passion is, look around at the people that you keep drawing in with the things you're doing. What kind of people are they? What needs do they have? What need do they have that you end up meeting for them? Sometimes you meet it for them either so easily that you've discounted it or so happenstancely that you don't even realize that you've done it. We're going to take another quick commercial break. During this break, I encourage you, make some notes to yourself. Who are the people that keep showing up in your life? Who are the ones that you've been fighting against that maybe they're the exact ones that you were meant to serve? If you do it, you may be one step closer to living as a thriving entrepreneur. We'll be right back. You've heard Kathy and I talk about it. You've seen the workshops. You have watched as others of your friends have become a best-selling author. And now it's your turn. Let me ask you this. What would being a best-selling author do for your business? Over 80% of people surveyed said that they want to write a book, which means that if you're listening, you probably are one of those people. Now is your time because you have a message that needs to be shared. That message is not for you. It's not for your ego. It is because it serves other people. Kathy and I are here to help you share your unique brilliance with the world. All you need to do is go to We Help youthrive.com check us out and find out how you can be a best selling author today welcome back to thriving entrepreneur this is Steve welcome back thanks for listening today to thriving entrepreneur I hope that we've been able to help you know poke at you a little bit and help you bring out your passion. Of course, I'd love it if you went to Amazon and picked up my book. Um, it's called Thriving Success Series Book One Passion by me, Steve Kidd. Uh, the forward is done by my first and oldest mentor, Dr. Donald Joy. Uh, Dr. Joy is in his 80s now, but he was the professor of moral development at Asbury Theological Seminary for a lot of years. He's been on the show. I encourage you to listen to his episode if you haven't heard it. Such amazing insight that he brings to the show. Um, you know, but He's written a lot of books over the years, and I really appreciated him taking the time to write the foreword for my book, slash now the series of books. Um, again, it's a thriving success series, book one, called Passion. And you can check it out on Amazon today. Um, you know, what I really want to leave you with is you are special, you are unique. I say it every time, so, you know, I hope you haven't gotten to the point where you started to discount it because I said it so much. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a purpose. So we find ourselves saying the same message all the time. Guess what? That's a message that needs to be said. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't keep coming up. We find ourselves surrounded by serving, having in our life a certain group of people. Guess what? They need you. You have something inherently within you that is crying out to them. That the spirit within them is saying, this person can help me. You need to be the person that is there helping them. You know, I've said it a couple of times on the show. Um, I love this quote by Lisa Nichols. You gotta understand, your gift was never for you. 
It's for the people that you're meant to serve. And we're doing a terrible injustice to the world, to the people who need us. When we hide our gift from the world because it's inconvenient, because it isn't the thing we thought we wanted to do, whatever the reason, whatever the, the point might be, if we are not showing up in the world as the best version of ourselves, we're robbing ourselves, but we're also robbing the world. And you really, really need to show up and show out as the best version of yourself. Take those couple of points that I made today. You do have a passion within you. And I know a lot of people out there, they struggle with, what should my business be about? What should I focus on? What am I meant to do in this world? And I encourage you to take just those two simple steps. First, what is that message that you just keep talking about? And second, who are the people that keep coming into your life? And how can you take that message and provide to them that thing they need? And then, of course, yes, the last step of that is, is there a way you could monetize that? Little big, little or big, it doesn't matter. Bringing that to them. One of the things I want to you know, share with you is, is that research has actually shown that when you put a dollar value on something, people value it more. There was a company I worked for a whole lot of years ago. Um, I did sales for their company for a little while, and they actually um, were selling tickets that had been, giving, been being given away for free to comedy clubs. Comedy clubs would give admission tickets away for free to people, and they actually started selling them. It was like 10 tickets for 20 bucks, so it wasn't a lot. Um, but what they found is is that like 80% of the tickets that they sold were being redeemed versus less than 5% of the tickets that they were giving away were being used. You see, you need to put a value on what you do, and then you need to share it with the world. That may start by joining us at bestsellersguild.com. It takes you to our free Facebook group where you can be part of our community. You can help change the world with your message. No matter where you are in the process of writing your book, whether you haven't started or you've got it all the way done, you need to have your book out there. You need to be a bestseller. You need to share your message with the world. And I do hope that you will come and join us at bestsellersguild.com because you are uniquely brilliant. I hope you got that today. You were created very specifically for a purpose. You're not an accident. You do have a passion and a purpose. And I can tell you absolutely the world needs you. Kathy and I are here to help you live every day of your life as a thriving entrepreneur. Until next time, have a great week. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you want to get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time. You've heard Kathy and I talk about it. You've seen the workshops. You have watched as others of your friends have become a best-selling author. And now it's your turn. Let me ask you this. What would being a best-selling author do for your business? Over 80% of people surveyed said that they want to write a book, which means that if you're listening, you probably are one of those people. Now is your time because you have a message that needs to be shared. That message is not for you. It's not for your ego. It is because it serves other people. Kathy and I are here to help you share your unique brilliance with the world. All you need to do is go to WeHelp.com 
youthrive.com. Check us out and find out how you can be a best-selling author today.